Welcome to episode 2 of the Marie Magdalene series and I'm very excited to bring you more into the realm of the actual myth, the person, the scriptures. Um, we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning. I really wanted that first episode to be based on the gospel and a little bit about presenting myself so that you would understand the context in which I observe this consciousness because obviously I'm talking from my experience and I'm sure you could meet a lot of people um, that could talk about their own experiences with Mary Magdalene. So welcome back. If you haven't watched the first episode, please do so. I'm going to add a card so that you can click on it and watch the whole thing and get introduced to the Gospel of Mary, of Mary Magdalene, and then let's go. So I want to kind of, I want to begin with what? <laughs> what happens? What's the story? So Mary Magdalene is introduced, she's introduced in the four Gospels of the New Testament. She's introduced 13 times. And because of the way she's introduced, and because she's introduced a little bit before or after different stories, the way that she's been portrayed by the people who inter interpret the scriptures has been faulty. That's the word that I can use at best, because um, I'm no one to say what is the truth. There's a lot of people who interpret the scriptures in a way, others see it in a different way, and it's kind of everyone wants to add their own mold to the scriptures, and I don't want to be that person, I don't want to create a mold. But I do have to say that I'm a person, so even though I try to be as objective as possible, whatever I've done here with my research, with what I'm choosing to talk about, there is going to be a filter. And I would love for it to have no filter, but hey, like you've got to know that I've been researching, I've been contacting, I've been experiencing, and I'm giving you things. And there are paths that are simply not interesting to me. So even though I'm, you know, creating this objective presentation, there's things that I don't see as fully complete. So I'm not going to present it, but others could think that it's actually quite tangible, quite quite sound and resonant, so they are going to present those things. So please know that I have a filter and that's, you know, <laughs> that's something that you have to know, that when you listen to me, you have to know that I'm talking through my own biases and that what I've studied and researched, I've also seen the biases of people. So some people want Mary Magdalene to represent the the freedom in the sexual movement, which is, you know, something super important. And they are going to portray a character within those realms. And some other people, like the Pope Gregory the First, wanted to portray her as the prostitute and, and so she's been portrayed as someone who had sinned and who had been pardoned by Jesus and so she was the sinner who now is devout. So I'm going to present, you know, the different things and then I'm also going to refer to the scriptures knowing that the scriptures were not always, uh, we think of them as being written by the apostles, Luke, Matthew, um, John and Peter. Not Peter, come on! Not Peter, Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark. <laughs> you know, I know them in French, so that's always going to be my excuse. Anyway, um, she's mentioned by them, but who are they? Those Gospels, we always think they've been written around like 33 after the death of Jesus and then so on. But some of them date from the second century. So it's like much later. And I'm gonna refer to my trusty notebook and um, my very difficult to read handwriting. So hi, <laughs> welcome to my life. So. <laughs> So she's referred 13 times in the scriptures and I've kind of gathered down those uh, references by stories. So Mark 
in the Gospel of Mark, she is referred as being by the cross when Jesus dies. Um, and she's present when they take his body from the cross and lay him in his tomb. Then she's also referred when the Sabbath is over and she goes to anoint him, to anoint his body, but he's not there. She meets a young man in white, thinks it's the gardener, happens to be a resurrected Jesus. Cool. Uh, in the second gospel by Matthew, she's mentioned as, um, while well, Joseph of Arimathea is taking the body of Jesus from the cross and she stays with him in the tomb opposite his body. So that's when she's mentioned. She's also mentioned after the Sabbath when she goes and meets Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, she's mentioned as being met by Jesus and he removes seven demons out of a woman. Then she's mentioned just before or after a woman who anoints Jesus with her tears and who was a sinner. So it's never said if it's her in the Gospel of Luke, but that's where she's mentioned as well. And then she's also mentioned at the tomb moment when they lay his body by the tomb. And then she's mentioned in the Gospel of John, being by the cross before his death, along with obviously John and Jesus' mother, Mary. And then she's mentioned as going the first day of the week after his death, she meets an empty tomb, Jesus is there, and she goes back to the apostles and says, I have seen the Lord. That's the mentions, 30, 13 times. So, I want to go back to what happened after that. What happens after that is that she's mentioned. And it gets a bit fuzzy because what we can see from archaeologists from historians is that women had power in the early Christian movement. Women could be bishops, they could baptize people, they could preach, they could deliver the good news. And that's not something that existed in Judaism. So that was very, very powerful. And to this day, it is not possible for women to be in a place of authority within the Catholic Church that's something that we ask for. I've seen there's movements in France where women are asking the Catholic Church to allow them to be pre preachers and, and to serve their community, but that's still not okay. I don't... If you've watched my first video, you might remember that I told you that Mary Magdalene arrived in France, south of France, after the death of Jesus, and that she actually preached the good news, she shared the fact that Jesus had resurrected, which is what is the good news, right? He has given himself and atoned for the sins of humanity. Um, that's the good news. <laughs> good news! Anyway, uh, <laughs> This is, this is my channel, I say whatever I want. Um, the way that she preaches and she baptizes people because we found stones within the church where she's buried, where she or someone would give early ba baptism uh, to the people in the community. So that's, uh, you know, that's a place of power to be a preacher, a preacher, an apostle, a disciple, a a bishop, that's authority, that's power. And women had that and up until the fourth century and then it stops. And then women are uh, put in a place of submission, of subordination, and only men are allowed to preach. And that's where the deviation starts. In 591, in 591, in the sixth century, the Pope Gregory I, states in his homily 33 that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute and that is the first mention of her as someone who sold her body for money, 
who had sex for money and that's something that at the time was uh, highly criticized, highly, um, it, it was a way to change her narrative and to change her image. And to this day, this image still stands and we don't have any proof of it. We don't have any proof of it in the scriptures. As I mentioned, she's never declared as that. The only time where she's declared as having something, it's Mary Magdalene and seven demons, which could be, you know, like the seven cardinal sins, which could be, you know, laziness, uh, avidity, and all the other sins. Or uh, she's mentioned along in the same paragraph as a sinner woman, but a woman who sinned, who was then pardoned by Jesus, but it's never said that it is her. So anyway, he makes that as a way to kind of destroy the first image of a woman empowered in the Christian myth, in the Christian story and the dogma. And that's a way for the woman, all the women, to be pushed away from having a voice, from sharing their way of having faith, their beliefs and religion or faith or spirituality is very different between um, men and women. That's not to say gender or um, sex has any impact on how you see things because we're both, we're all a mix of both. For example, one would say men are within the scriptures and women are within the experience. But as you can see here, I'm very touched. I'm very um, um, attached to the scriptures as well as the experiences. So I think it's all about having that mix, that androgyny, that meeting point between those two to create my own um, temple, my own temple, my pillars, scriptures, the word, the dogma and then my own experiences, my own meaning, the consciousness that I'm talking about. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So for them, uh, for that, again, patriarchy to, to destroy any connection for women to be a part of that life is shifting the Christian movement. Just like when we talked about Peter and the Gospel of Mary, again, we're taking a hard turn. And that's that's something that's so interesting because the very scriptures that we mentioned, then the whole movement is, you know, attached to, we have a rebel at the head of the movement. Jesus is such a rebel. He is uh, touching lepers. He's in contact with people who are, you know, the tax collectors, which were really badly seen at the time, or he's in contact with women. Women are financing his um, mission, his um, tenure. Could we say tenure? Uh, he is followed by women. He's, he's really like considering them and, and preaching for them. He's, he's doing big work. And the fact that there's a man who says, accept everyone, forgive everyone, open yourself to everyone. Everyone is your brother and your sister. And then that someone takes those scriptures and shift it. And then we have the debasement of the woman power, the woman energy, the woman strength and faith. And that we dim it down. Well, you know, patriarchy, but that's just... Um, that makes me angry because it's illogical and yet and yet we've believed it and we followed that for millenniums. So what can I say? Let's go back to Mary Magdalene. So 591, this Pope Gregory the First says she's a prostitute. Everyone sees her as a prostitute. That's why in all the paintings you see how she's represented. The, the, the paintings that I showed you in the first video where she's really like this archetype of the naked woman and uh, in a lassive position where she's both mm, discriminated against, criticized and very part of the erotic archetypes, the, the, the daydream of men who 
both want that kind of woman and also must assert their power on their that kind of woman and and control and contrive the others. So what can I say? Uh, nothing is logical even though it looks like everything has been built. Uh, let me try to go back to compassion. I'm getting angry here. <laughs> all right, so that's the cliche, all right? In 1969, look at that date, the Catholic Church finally says, we're sorry. We're sorry for saying this for over a thousand years and 400 years. She's not a prostitute. We're sorry we said that. But it doesn't change anything because she's still portrayed as such. She is the canonic prostitute who's been pardoned by Jesus. And and I want to add a little bit of context here because when they say prostitution, she's a prostitute as a way to, you know, change her image and debase her, that's based on their context. Her, the Christian or the Catholic or the monotheist or most patriarchal religions have been considering that sex work is debasing. So that's based on their context. So what I present here is the context that they took on. That's not to add value to their criticism. That's not to confirm their use of word. That's not to say that prostitution is a bad thing. It's just to just tell it how they told it was. I'm just delivering facts and sex work is work and that's a choice. That's it. If you choose it, that's it. That's all that matters. Nobody should be adding a judgment to it. Nobody should telling you their two cents on it and that's it. Just, I just want to say that I'm not conferring any sense to it than what they just said. So going back to the story, 1969, the Catholic Church says, sorry, we were wrong, and nothing much happens. And then in July 2016, the current Pope that we have, Francis I, um, says the official pardon and renames Mary Magdalene as the Apostle of Apostles, which is something that had been used again a little bit before, a little bit before, a thousand and five hundred years before by Augustine, but the Apostle of Apostles is... Apostle means messenger. It means to carry a message. And Mary Magdalene is the first person who saw Jesus being resurrected. So she delivers the good news to the very selected messengers. So the 12, well, 11 men who were disciples of Jesus because Judas died just a little bit before. She tells those 11 men, Jesus is back. So that makes her the apostle of apostles because she tells the messengers, she's the messenger of the messengers. She's the first one to relay the good news. So she's been named as such. She has a feast which is the 22nd of July. This is the day of Mary Magdalene. That's the story. That's the story with facts. And then the rest is going to be a uh, little research and different interpretations on, on the myth, the, the consciousness, the energy, the healing that you can get, the res like everything, my own experiences, and let's go. So last time I left you when I was letting you know that I was climbing on that beautiful forest where she lived as a hermit, or at least where she lived before her death. So Mary Magdalene had been, been in Marseille, Massilia, and um, Aix en Provence, <laughs> goes back, goes away from the cities, stops to be a preacher, a bishop, to baptize people. She stops converting others and she focuses on her own inner faith, religion, consciousness. She retreats 
and that's where she's portrayed as someone who asks for forgiveness for her sins but more likely it it was about meeting God and having a life um, offered to contemplation which is one of the pathos of the divine feminine but anyway I left you when I was talking about the cave of eggs so I want to just show you where I was in the very moment where I entered the cave of eggs hi um, <laughs> I made it I hiked uh, a lot in that mountain I'm in La Sainte Boom and I made it to a very <laughs> tricky hike and I made it to the cave of eggs which is called Grotte aux Oeufs, which which is a sacred site it has the shape of the yoni as you can see like the sacred feminine I'm entirely alone there's absolutely no one <laughs> I conquered the fear of heights there was a lot of places where it was actually dangerous to hike and I still follow the trail and I'm on my own so it's a little bit maybe it might be stupid but I don't know I just wanted to share a little bit of where I'm at and the energy and I'm gonna take you in the cave so let's go by the way there's little things here everywhere and you can see like Rotozo so it's really cold inside and I'm gonna have to put the flat and what happens is that I was first going to the cave of Mary Magdalene the one that is officially presented as such and it is something that you climb towards and then you go and you can buy a candle and you can pray and, and then you see statues and different places where she's presented as sleeping there, eating there, praying there, being lifted by angels all the way up to the cliff and then down again every day and that cave is closed all right, so let's go back to a little point. Um, so that cave, that official cave, was closed. Because uh, boulders are menacing, threatening to fall. So they kind of closed everything down. It's not announced on the website. It's, I found out when I was in the taxi drive all the way there, which is not deserved not deserved by buses and trains and it's quite lost and I didn't have a car so I planned to have a taxi and then the taxi guy, the taxi driver told me like by the way uh, you're gonna be able to see the forest, that's cool you can do the climb, that's cool too but the cave is closed and on my way there I remembered there's a second cave the actual, actual, or like, you know, like the non-touristy cave, the cave of eggs. And I had seen a short mention of it in one of the books that I read before. So on a very flimsy internet connection, while being in the middle of nowhere in that taxi ride, I frantically start Googling the location of that second cave and I find only one mention of it online and it's like a very dodgy website from <laughs> like a very old website of people who love to walk in nature which is you know amazing cool and there's very few informations there is no map and I'm running out of internet so I'm like I'm not prepared I thought I was but I'm not prepared all right let's go so the taxi driver leaves me where the parking lot is and then it's a few hours of climbing without any kind of map and please don't do this kids please get prepared and <laughs> I basically climb the forest and I'm, I'm deciding that I'm gonna go where the tourist cave is and I start doing like language and I have food and water with me and I'm climbing and climbing and it's hot but the trees are protecting me with their shadows and it's really cool and I end up in front of that closed barricaded cave and I don't know what to do because it's closed right and I don't want to go down 
uh, go down the forest again and having missed my opportunity, right? So I sit down and <laughs> I just sit down at this point and I wait. And two minutes later, a couple were, they're like in their mid fifties. They go down from one side of the road and I ask them, oh my God, did you just go to the cave? Because I thought it was forbidden because it's written, like there's a thing from the French government saying, do not go there. And you know, I'm like, yes, it could be dangerous, you know, right? Or maybe I could get arrested. And I tend to follow what the, <laughs> I tend to follow. I follow what the law says. That's who, I don't know, right? Jupiter and Libra, I'm like following what the law tells me to do. And I see them come down and I'm like, oh my God, it's written forbidden, but, but you're, on the road, right? Uh, what did you do? Where did you go? And they're like, oh, we just climbed over the thing. And I'm like, okay, so if they did it and they look, you know, a little bit old, maybe I can do it too. So I go to the Cave of Eggs, the second one, the one with the dodgy map. And obviously I don't have internet anymore. And it's, it was not, it was not even a map. It was just like a few photos from a very badly, bad quality camera. And that's it. So I'm like, okay, they did it. So it's doable. They don't even have like hiking shoes. I can do it. And I go. And <laughs> it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Plus, those people did not go to where I was going. They just climbed over the barricade on the very touristy cave. That's it. That's what they did. They did not go to the other one. But I misunderstood. Mercury must have been in retrograde. And I went with my gut and I did something stupid. <laughs> Which is, I went off the path. No one knew where I was going. I didn't have network, I didn't have internet, I couldn't call. And I did a 45 minute plus hike along a cliff with no barricade, with no cord, no barrier. It was emptiness. The cliff, me, empty for hundreds of meters. So this is an easy part, even though it falls like this compared to the rest, because I actually have trees to hang on to. But yeah, the view is nice. And I'm scared of heights, so cool. <laughs> I wasn't aware this would be happening, but yeah, it's an initiation, I guess. I'm taking, I'm taking that risk and it's beautiful, it's just, I'm scared, but it's beautiful, but look at that, how am I supposed to find that? Oh. And I did that, holding on to roots and trees and random branches in my sneakers for 45 minutes plus and I made it. <laughs> I arrived to the Cave of Eggs following random little green paints that would tell me I was still on the path and sometimes you wouldn't see those green paints for a long while and you had no idea if you had straight up the path because sometimes it's separated into closer to the cliff or closer to the emptiness and I made it. <laughs> it was scary as fuck because hi! I have vertigo. Yes, I'm scared of heights. And <laughs> after talking to myself, talking to the Akasha Crackers, talking to Mary Magdalene on my own in the sun <laughs> for 45 minutes, being scared shitless, shaking, I arrived there. And when I arrived there, I heard my guides tell me that every initiation every spiritual experiences comes with trials and that was the trial and when 
I arrived there, I was not expecting it at all. It kind of blew me away. I was expecting a bigger entrance. I was just walking alongside the cliff and at one point I just turned left and it was that big opening. And I shook and I cried so much because it was not just a cave, it was a presence. It was a presence of not only Mary Magdalene, but of the goddess, of, of the divine feminine, of that archetype where better be respectful, otherwise you're gonna get crushed. It was the most powerful experience in my life and I did not enter that cave for a while. I was just on the ground crying my eyes out, panicked, alone in nature, <laughs> not knowing if I would make it back because the first, the way in was super scary and I didn't know if I would make the way out. And I just cried and cried and cried because even though I was alone in nature, I wasn't alone. I was not. This place was inhabited. I was not alone. And I was not with a presence that looks like a human consciousness. No, it was like this I was being enveloped by the goddess itself, herself, and it was not enveloped or uh, comforted or loved, but met. I don't know how to describe it more. I was scared and I was in admiration, in reveration, and I felt so small, and I felt like I belonged, and I felt seen with all the layers, which was also that scary thing, right? Like I'm a Scorpio, I'd rather keep a few layers, you know? I was seen, there was no mistaking that, I was fully, fully, <laughs> I was fully seen understood, breathed in, and took time. And I finally entered the grotto. I started live on Instagram, which is what you've just seen. And it lasted longer, but somehow the network cut me or cut the replay, but I stayed there. And even though, you know, it looks like I was not prepared and I couldn't see the official cave, which was closed. I'd rather have only seen what I saw, what I met, because one was the touristic place and the other was the real presence. And the story of this cave, called the Cave of X, is that people would come there from ages old, you know, before and before, before Mary Magdalene, they would come there and they had, they, their belief was that it was inhabited by Diana, Artemis, the goddess of the moon, of the hunt, of the, the woman who lives in nature. And they would place eggs with little characters inside, little figurines, and they would ask for pregnancy, for fecundity, for protecting their children, or having new children. So this location within the structure of the of the walls, you can see it's naturally shaped and bent in ways where you can put little eggs everywhere. And it really felt like one of those doors that take you to the center of the earth. It was so cold inside, so cold. And, and the difference between the outside, the outside warmth and burning out of July and the freezing cold inside, it really created a sense of, there was a smoke 
a temperature change, something that happened between those two, and, and I was within that liminal space in between those two, alone, not able to, um, to have something steady to hold on to, and that's the beauty of the Divine Feminine, it's, it's shaking you, it's, it's flow, it's something that takes you, you have to float, you have to, to be carried by the flow, because there's nothing to hold on to. So let's go back to the experience. So I actually went down the mountain again and down the forest and I sang light language out loud even though people would be able to see me because I felt that um, I need to exchange something back. That's what we could call it, even though it's something more, but uh, that forest is not just a bunch of trees and that's something that you can see and in my other series of videos called the Celtic Path there's something about the network of trees and, and their connection and the place and the memory that they hold together and every um, the habitat of all the animals and I just had this beautiful series of songs that I just heard in my heart and I was just translating it so that um, my voice or more like my ability to produce sound could be offering some kind of I wouldn't say healing or I wouldn't say delight but some kind of energy that they could be using for something whatever they want to I didn't have intentions just my heart was singing I gave it and then they do whatever they want with it but something that was interesting is that on my way in, I filmed a little bit of light language and movements that I felt within me for my um, my premium membership and something where people uh, access exclusive content that I since stopped. But at the time I was doing that and within that video, I could see that my light body was visible and that's something that I never saw on video and I tried as a skeptical photographer to understand what was happening and I was like, is it the optics? Like, please explain to me why I'm able to see my light body being part of that video. Why is it caught on camera? It can't, can't, can't be my light body, right? And to this day, I don't know. I don't know what to explain. So make up your own mind yeah <laughs> so to go back to Miriam to Mary to I would love to refer to them from now on we're going to refer to them as Yeshua for Jesus and Miriam for Mary of Magdala are you good with that it's, it's just you know I don't want to transform so let me present a little bit what we know archaeologically speaking and historically speaking about Mary Magdalene because we've talked about the scriptures, I've talked about my experiences all up until that point and now I'm going to tell you more about what the studies could be bringing us. So Mary comes from a city that is north of Tiberias and the city is called Magdala and it's it's quite a big city. It's on the sea, it's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and the city amounts to 40,000 people at the time. It's famous for its fishes, a lot of fishermen are going there, and so she comes from that town. And archaeologically speaking, we have been finding extremely powerful energetical things, I mean, to the archaeologues, it's cool. To me, it's, oh, it's magical including that stone, that stone that was found in the synagogue. I cannot believe, I can't believe it's here. I want to say something, Magdala, the, coming from Magdala is so interesting because Magdal, Magdala comes from the word Migdal, which means the tower. And so that city might have had a tower, right? To be the tower of fishermen, the tower of fishes. But... The tower is something that means a lot in esoteric terms. The tower is a card in the tarot, it's a ma major arcana, and the tower means the pillar, means the temple. So again, we're in the realm of deeper meanings, and 
That's something that I wanted to share because Mary means the merging, the mer, the, 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 the sea, the water. It means the merging, the merging, the tower, the merge. It, it means something to me. And I hope that when we enter this new realm of talking about the, the feminine energy, the hidden aspects of the Christian mysteries, the resurrection, the Christ consciousness, I hope that this means something to you. And my belief is that we can find unity, we can address the mental of Peter, we can address the, the mind, the scriptures, the even the systems that were created to make this religion what it is now, because I think all of this oppression, all of those conversions, that's disgusting and has hurt so many people, has killed so many people. It's been traumatic on both ends. Um, on the ends where there were martyrs in the beginning of the Christian movement, including Jesus, and then they ended up, the Christians ended up making, creating martyrs out of every other religion or pagans. And I want to say that we can find, I mean, the, the point in, in all of this is to create something where we have unity again. Obviously, it's going to require difficult movements and difficult concepts, difficult conversations, and I also think that this unity might be idealism, definitely. I don't think it's gonna be possible within the human concept or, or the human consciousness for... I mean, who knows, right? Who knows, we'll see. But at least respect. At least we can respect one another. That's, that's what I would love. And it's just respect is the basis of everything, so that but anyway going back to the tower the tower of light the pillar of light miriam of magdala and that means a lot second she's always represented as uh, either having an egg so again the cave of eggs having the egg the cos the cosmic egg the, the beginning the very beginning of everything the seed for everything but she's also presented as having a jar an alabaster jar of ungent of spike knot very expensive ungent very expensive salve a very um reserved for anointments for royal anointments for weddings for death and it is said that that's what she used to give this unction to Jesus was worth a year's salary. And she was criticized for that uh, amongst the scripture. You can see that she was criticized for that. And Jesus replies that she better be using it for that. And and that action in, in the scriptures also means that she recognizes and gives him the status of being the Messiah, of being the person who was supposed to come, who was announced in the Old Testament. She's accomplishing the prophecy and she's also anointing him at a very crucial moment, which means his fate is to die. And that's a moment that is still a bit of a secret but somehow she knew before any of the disciples she knew that he was gonna die and that's why she gives him this function this anointment I'm losing a lot of energy saying that oh so I want to talk about two things two little mysteries that are really really cool <laughs> and they are part of what you can find when you go to the relics to the body to the place where she is in Saint Maxima la Saint Paul. so that's a basilica because a basilica is a church where there's relics and the basilica is containing the relics of her of Saint Maxima and within those relics we can find a few things that are worth mentioning because uh, they are part of my own experiences. I didn't know them from books. I knew them from <laughs> attending a weird 
really weird moment in that church where I actually spent three days in that city. So I would go, you know, mornings and nights. I, I would I would just follow my intuition and I would repeatedly go um, in her crypt and buy her bones, which were uh, on the altar because it was her feast day. So they take her body out of the crypt and they put it on the altar and uh, one morning I was there and they said we have a, a private tour if you want to attend it's for free it's it's done by monks and the Dominican monks two Dominican monks and they're going to present the church I was like okay I've been there three times already but why not, right? So I follow and I listen and obviously those monks were repeatedly reinforcing the image that she had been a sinner and a prostitute and a lot of things that uh, made me boil inside but you know I was uh, trying to be respectful of whatever was going on because other people were having moments with within that a specific belief system and they were you know like following the sculptures and the things and I was like oh but the scriptures say something different anyway uh, <laughs> It's the Scorpio in me, um, the Scorpio Mercury. And at the end of all of it, they asked if we had questions. And that's that's when your girl was like, let's, let's go, <laughs> let's go. So I asked a few questions and we talked about a few things that were interesting. So one is, um, we have the skull. We have the skull, we have that on display and underneath the skull there's something a little thing that you don't really see or you don't really pay attention to it but it is a piece of skin that has not decayed with time because this body died 2000 years ago all right this body died 2000 years ago Obviously, the skull stays, but skin, when it's not embalmed in specific ways, it's supposed to degrade, right? It's supposed to disappear. We have a piece of skin that was attached to the skull and never disintegrated, and it fell in 1789, the French Revolution, where Obviously, a lot of things happen within the church so that they could be protecting the relics because you smash the French Revolution, they were against the church, they basically destroyed a lot of things that were part of the church, and they means the people, and you know, they were oppressed, so they needed to take their revenge on something. Obviously, they killed thousands of people during the terror, they just guillotined everyone. And what they were doing to the stones, to the statues, to the relics is also guillotine them, just remove the heads, remove the heads of most statues. And I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm just so, so, so sad um, because we actually are extremely lucky and gifted. We have a lot of privilege within that religion uh, with relics. We have so many of them. And so much of them have been endangered because of the revolution. I am not a royalist. I'm also not a partisan of the terror movement. I mean, I'm just watching things from 200 years after and I'm just a bit sad that they had to destroy shit. But anyway, um, so basically they had to uh, protect the relic of Mary Magdalene. So they moved her so that she wouldn't be set on fire like a lot of relics. Uh, she wouldn't be destroyed, um, things, things that. And that piece of skin that was stuck here a little bit on the right, but like on the forehead fell but still did not disintegrate and it's been kept in that little glass container and what is it? What is that piece of skin? It is called the noli mi tangere or tangere. I mean it's Latin so noli mi tangere. Um, <laughs> let me check. What would Google say? But the Gospels, the New Testament, it's written in Greek. So I actually have the Greek word, um, which is memu aptu. <laughs> I'm 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna discook the nuni. Memo apto. Memo apto, uh, which is the original in Greek, in ancient Greek, which means don't cling on to me, uh, for he hasn't fully taken his shape again. So, so when Jesus says that, he actually avoids Mary Magdalene touching him by putting his hands on her forehead and that's the location where the noli mitangere, the piece of skin, is attached to the skull. Yeah, we have the fingerprints of Jesus on a piece of skin that's been attached to a skull for 17th century, like a thousand and seven hundred years, more than that. And then it fell during the revolution when they moved the skull and now they put it in a glass container and it still hasn't shifted, it still hasn't disintegrated and it's still there. That's cool. Really cool. Really, really cool. Fingerprints. You could see the fingerprints of Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Second thing, second thing, the holy ampulla. You know, there's something that's really cool. Some other thing that's really cool. So basically, as we mentioned in all the Gospels, Mary Magdalene was present at the crucifixion. She was there, she was underneath the cross, and the blood of Jesus was falling on the ground. She picked a piece of the soil with this blood in it and put it in a container that has been with her all the way to San Maxima after her life in France, and that was called the Holy Ampulla. Ampulla means light bulb. And basically it looked like a light bulb filled with soil, dried soil. And every year when the body, when the relic were put forward on the altar, the Holy Ampulla, which was filled with soil, whenever they would read the text where Jesus is crucified, as they do a few days before Easter on Holy Friday, without missing a bit, without missing a single day of a single year, the soil, which was dry, would become bloody, red, and liquid every year and that would be the case for three days all the way until easter monday when jesus was resurrected and the blood would dry and disappear and it was back to soil and that was a phenomenon that people would go and see every year people who believed people who didn't believe and we have accounts of people who are very skeptical, who make the journey all the way to saint Maxima in the south of France. And they go, and they witness it. And they have their legs shaking when they go out of the church because that happened. The sad thing is that in 1901, in 1901, someone stole the Holy Emperor. So I did not see it. And I did not find a photo of it. And this happens also once, twice, and three times a year in Naples with um, a relic from San Gennaro. And yeah, it didn't happen in 2020, <laughs> which is wild. Um, but it happens when popes visit or when it's the uh, anniversary of the martyrdom of San Gennaro or Saint Januarius, January, Januarius, um, San Gennaro. So it's not one of the only weird mystery of Christianism. Um, anyway, so I wanted to share that. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Like and subscribe. See you in the next episode.